All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, my name is Bert, and uh, welcome to my talk about MLOps. I'm gonna skip the introduce yourself part because I think, or at least I hope, that I have uh, more interesting things to talk about than my yeah, personal life and uh, work life, right? So instead, I'm gonna start with the why. Why am I giving a talk about MLOps through crowd, mainly consisting out of uh, uh, out of <laughs> out of software engineers. <coughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, there ah, there we are. So why am I giving a talk about MLOps, so machine learning ops to a crowd mainly consisting out of software engineers? According to a recent survey, 76% of uh, the software engineers indicate that they are actually interested in machine learning. They wanted to know and learn how to do machine learning. Unfortunately, only 24% of those software engineers indicated that they actually have the feeling that they succeeded. And I think one of the reasons is because of the following diagram. This is a picture taken from an online course, Introduction into Machine Learning, which tries to explain in layman's terms what a neural network is, right? So I'll quickly go over it. So a neural network consists out of neurons organized in different layers, right? And you train a neural network by uh, providing it with training data, which gets propagated through the network and you get a result. You compare that result with uh, the expected result and you calculate the error. And then you start tuning, updating your network. And it's done by a technique called backpropagation. And to explain what backpropagation is, I will go in detail over all the four mathematical equations. And I guess some of you now are starting to think, you know, what are the other talks about in the parallel sessions? And is it still feasible to sneak out, right? Uh, don't worry, I'm not gonna go that direction. Compare that with something probably you all recognize the Hello World example. I still remember, uh, it was during my first year at the university, my professor gave those three lines of codes together with instructions on how to run them. And magically the words Hello World appeared on my screen. Instant gratification, right? And then he started explaining what statements were and gradually moving to what functions are. He didn't start with explaining uh, what bytecode is, how the compiler works, uh, what a stack in a heap is, etc. And that's typically how we humans tend to learn best. First, we need to grasp the core concepts and then gradually add layer by layer extra details and complexity. Right? Now, if you look at like 90% of the machine learning courses, they start with statistics, calculus, then they move over to linear regressions and then go to the neural network part. Ideally, carpet bombing us with as much mathematical equations as possible, right? And I think we as software engineers actually have a better way into the world of uh, machine learning and that's through MLOps, so machine learning operations. And why? Because you will see uh, through my presentation that there are actually a lot of uh, familiarities and similarities between MLOps and DevOps slash software engineering. So let's go back to the start and I'll explain on a need to know basis what machine learning is, right? And then I will move to what the model development life cycle is and finish with uh, what is MLOps and give a small demo of one of the more popular uh, MLOps tools. So what is machine learning? And I'm gonna explain it by comparing it with uh, traditional programming. So in traditional programming, uh, the, the business presents you with a certain use case, and upfront we start analyzing. We, we're gonna 
start thinking on what is the, the, the logic we need to implement, what are the business rules we need to implement. And then we start coding, and we have our application where you can provide new input and it will provide us with output. Let's take the example of an email spam classifier. Uh, so in your inbox, uh, mails arrive and you need to decide whether it's a regular mail or a spam email. Right. Up front, you can think on some of the rules. Uh, for example, if it contains three times the word free, uh, maybe uh, in capitalized letters, or it's coming from a list of uh, well-known spammer IPs, yeah, then it's, then it's uh, spam. Right. And then after a year, uh, the spammers become inventive and they start sending out mails uh, pretending to be Nigerian princes offering you some money, right? So what do you do? You update your rules and you redeploy, right? What if we would tackle that same problem uh, with a machine learning approach, right? So we're not gonna ourselves upfront think on what the logic is, the rules are, the patterns we need to detect. We're gonna let the machine learning training decide it for us. And how are we gonna decide those rules? Is by providing it with training data. So we pro provide our spam classifier with a set of emails together with um, a label, whether it's a spam email or a regular email, right? And then we do the machine learning training and the result is what we call a machine learning model, right? And a machine learning model is nothing more than also a set of rules, logic, just like a regular application, right? So you can provide it with no input and it will provide you with the output, right? And if the Nigerian princess, uh, those mails are, are coming in our uh, inbox, yeah, we tend to click the this is spam button and we uh, automatically gather new training data and uh, yeah, we, we retrain our model. Right. Now, in the previous slide, I focused on the training part, right? But just as software engineering isn't only about uh, coding, putting machine learning models into production isn't only about the training part. There are a lot of activities around the training part, like, uh, you need to gather data, you need to clean the data. Uh, of course, you need to test your model, uh, you need to monitor it once it's in production. And all those activities, they, they follow a certain flow. And this flow is what we call the model development life cycle. Just like we have the software development life cycle. Now, just as a quick reminder, you probably all know this by heart, eh? the software development life cycle. Eh? It starts with, with an analysis phase, then you start coding, then your code gets tested, uh, you fix the bugs, and once it's approved, you put it in production, and you always need to know the state of your system, so you start monitoring, right? Now, the model development life cycle has some similarities, but also some important differences. And I will high level go over every step in a little bit more detail and explain what they are all about. Right? So the first step is the data gathering and typically it's done in what we call data pipelines. So we, inge we ingest raw data, we start transforming that data, uh, cleaning data for example, uh, what to do with missing values and, and outliers, etc. And we transform it into structured data. And out of that structured data, the data scientist picks some elements, what they think are important uh, for the machine learning training phase. And those elements, if for example, the age of a customer, uh, his income level, etc. So those elements is what we call features, right? So the next step is uh, what I already talked about is doing the training, basically, uh, have uh, an algorithm try to detect what the logic and patterns is for you. And once you have your model, you need to test it. And testing a model is different than testing software, right? Why? Because in software, like I mentioned, we upfront 
decide what the business rules are, the logic we need to implement. And the testing phase is simply validating that we correctly implemented those rules, right? But with machine learning, we don't know upfront what the business logic will be. The only thing we have is data. So what do we do? That big training data set that we gather, so all those mails with their labels, we take a small subset and we put it apart. We're, we're not going to use that data, those samples, during the training phase. And once the model is being trained, we're going to present those new cases and those new emails and see whether or not uh, our model predicts correctly whether it's spam or not. And we simply do some counting, right? There are different formulas for that. But in the end, you get a certain metric or a couple of metrics, which is called the accuracy of a model, right? Now, that model uh, training and that um, evalua and, uh, the evaluation of a model isn't like a one-off. It's done either in parallel, eh, you train a couple of models, or in sequence where you, where you tune and try some extra stuff out, right? And that's being done in what we call experiments. And in machine learning, experiments are key. Um, the main difference between software engineering is that yeah, up front we have our business logic and we impl implement it in, in one way. It's not that we start with implementing four alternative versions and then checking which is the best one, right? While in uh, machine learning, there are a couple of things you can play with to see what provides you the model with the best accuracy. And those things are, in the first place, your model architecture. Remember that complicated diagram? You have the amount of neurons you can play with, the amount of layers, the way your uh, data propagates through the network, etc. Right? So that's your architecture. Then you have also have like your training parameters, which are called hyperparameters. Uh, things like learning rate, it doesn't matter what it is for now. Uh, that's one of those layers of complexity you can le learn later on, right? But just know that, that those are parameters you can play with to train and tune uh, your learning process. And then, of course, yeah, you can train on different uh, data sets, uh, different features. And it's a little bit like uh, when you want to bake uh, a lemon cake or a cupcake. Uh, you go on the internet and you start looking for recipes, right? And you have like 10 different recipes. Those recipes, they are your model architectures. And every recipe has a set of ingredients. And maybe you can swap out some ingredients. Hey, maybe you want to, to, to swap the sugar for a more uh, health, healthier alternative, right? So those are your features you can play with. And then you have instructions. For example, the temperature you should put your oven on and how long you, you should put it on the oven. Also, with those parameters, you can play. And in the end, you try until you have what you think is the perfect lemon cake. Now, it's very important that during that process of experimentation, you keep track of, uh, of all the experiments. And this is a screenshot of, uh, of uh, one such uh, MLOps tool uh, called MLflow, which is used to track your experiments. Uh, you need to track the, the model, uh, the data you've been using, the parameters you've been using, and of course, your accuracy metrics. Right? And then at the end, you get a model which you think is accurate enough to put in production there. It's just like a regular software you need to uh, deploy. Uh, you need to think on stuff like availability and reliability, etc. right? And then in, in the end, once it's in production, you need to monitor it. And also there you have your typical application monitoring, like system health, uh, CPU and memory, etc. But you have also something extra which is called data or model drift. So it's quite possible that you train a model like a year ago, and although you didn't retrain that model or didn't change anything, the accuracy of your model 
is decreasing. Not because you changed anything, but because the world around it changed. Let me give you an example. Um, if you would have trained uh, a, a model based on TV viewing behavior like 10 years ago, and then suddenly Netflix appears. Although you didn't change anything on your, mo on your model, the whole TV view viewing behavior changed and the accuracy decreased. Right? So now you have a general understanding of what um, machine learning is uh, and what the model development life cycle is. Now what is MLOps? Right? And again, I'm going to explain it by comparing it with something that feels familiar, DevOps. Right? So remember the days before DevOps. You had like a software development team that did the coding, uh, created the build that was tested, right? And once it was approved, there was like a handover to the operations team whose respons responsibility was to put it in production. So they created a release, they deployed it, and they started monitoring it. And if there were bugs coming out of that monitoring, they created a ticket so they could be solved, right? It was all based on handovers, which in theory sign, uh, sounds fine, but in reality, those handovers often were a hassle, right? Things got lost in translation. We started blaming each other. Um, also, the way back, you couldn't access all the production logs, etc. So what did we do? We invented something called DevOps. And if you ask a software development team, are you doing DevOps? We typically tend to answer with, yes, because I'm using Bitbucket for our source repository and Bamboo for our CI CD, and I'm deploying on Kubernetes to have availability and scalability. But actually, DevOps in the first place is, uh, is about a process, a mindset, a set of principles where you make one team end-to-end -end responsible uh, for putting um, applications in, in production um, based on collaboration, so not handover. And why? Because of yeah, faster time to market, agility, uh, knowledge transfer, etc. Right. Now, what about machine learning? And this is uh, an actual use case uh, from a company I worked for like a couple of years ago. They had a data engineering team whose responsibility was to ingest raw data, create data pipelines, and in the end, provide features. Then the data scientists could start uh, doing their modeling, right? And if there was a feature missing, they needed to go back to the data engineers and ask whether they could provide that data. And then the data scientists start modeling. Typically, data scientists like to model in things like a notebook, which we as software engineers think is just scripting and playing around, right? So once they train their model, the software engineers uh, thought, yeah, we can't put that in production. We need to industrialize it. We need to introduce things like clean code, reusability, uh, stuff like security, etc. right? Um, and then, yeah, once the software engineers did their work, it, it follows the, uh, the, the typical uh, uh, software application pattern. There was a handover to the operations team, right? meaning triple the amount of handovers triple the amount of trouble. So what did we do? We invented something and we called it MLOps. And what is MLOps? It's about making one team responsible end-to-end -end for analytical use cases based on collaboration, right? So what is MLOps? It's about the process, a set of principles, etc., etc., supported by a set of tools. So I talked about uh, the principles. What are some of the principles of DevOps? And I'm not gonna go over all those principles in detail. Uh, there are things like continuous integration and delivery, focus on the illities like maintainability, availability, reliability, etc. right? Now, what about the principles of um, MLOps? Actually, they are exactly the same. All those principles also adhere to MLOps. So, is MLOps actually a fancy word for DevOps? 
Not exactly. There is one big difference, and I'm going to uh, show the difference by one of the principles, traceability. And so in uh, regular software uh, engineering, let's say you deploy your application on a Kubernetes cluster, so you're running a Docker container somewhere, which has a certain Docker image with a tag. You should be able to trace that Docker image and tag back to its release, to its build, to a certain hit tag, and then you can see uh, what commits are in that tag and who made those commits, right? Now, in MLOps, we're not only concerned about code, but also two other artifacts, the model and the data that's being used. And if we map those three layers onto uh, the uh, model development lifecycle, if we start with the data layer, you see that you need to keep track of the raw data, the features, the training data, yeah, the test data you used, the accuracy metrics, but also the production data. I remember the data drift and the model drift I talked about. And then during the experimentation, yeah, just like on that uh, screenshot of, th of that uh, MLOps tool, MLflow, we need to keep track of the, the, uh, all the, the candidate, mo candidate models and, of course, yeah, which is the model that is actually running in production. And on the, on the code layer, we have the pipeline code, the training code, but also the application code, for example. As, uh, typically, we want to integrate our model into another service. Right. And we also need to keep track of the dependencies between them. Huh? Which experiment is using which training data, which training code, and which are the accuracy metrics, right? So, um, yeah, I, I emphasized the fact that MLOps and DevOps is about the principles and the process, but we're still software engineers. We still like our tools, right? So now I'm gonna give a demo of um, one of the more popular uh, MLOps tools called Kubeflow. Um, also to make it a little bit more tangible, right? Now, Kubeflow, Kubeflow's mission is to make end-to-end -end machine learning workflows work on uh, Kubernetes and make it as, as simple, as scalable and portable as, as possible. Right? But Kubeflow is actually a collection of already existing best-of-breed uh, frameworks and technologies where they put some Kubeflow sauce on top of it to make sure that it integrates well, that we have a nice dashboard, but also to abstract away certain uh, technicalities. For example, one of the components is Istio, and Istio is a service mesh. And Istio in itself can become quite complicated. But when using Kubeflow and you deploy your models using Kubeflow, behind the scenes, things like virtual services are created for you, but you don't know, have to know the details. Right. Um, for the demo, I'm of course going to use the use case of uh, email spam classifier. So remember that company I worked for uh, a couple of years ago, um, they decided to build uh, a new version of their spam classifier based on machine learning. They learned from previous experiences uh, in their machine learning uh, project, so they decided to do it properly and using the MLOps way. So they created one big team uh, consisting out of yeah, software engineers, data engineers and data scientists. And we uh, booked a couple of hours in their agenda to do a whiteboard ses session. And on that whiteboard session, we were going to decide what are all the steps we need to implement and take to get that model trained and put in, in production. So the data scientists start and said, of course, I need to train my model, right? And um, I started explaining a little bit, uh, like I did, that training a model is done on data. So I need males with a label. 
So the data engineer said, ah, but I know uh, I have access to a mail server and I can create a, an export and put it on a file, file server, for example. Then uh, the data scientist said, yeah, but for my first version, maybe I don't want to use the images from the mail. So can you clean those mails and maybe uh, strip out punctuations, for example, and irre irrelevant words like stop words, etc. So we need to clean our mails. And then he started explaining that ideally, neural networks actually work on numbers, not words. So somehow we need to convert those words into numbers. And then the interesting things start, right? You start discussing on yeah, how to transform words into numbers. And now you can learn from each other, right? Because yeah, as a software engineer, you, you might come up with, yeah, let's just give every word a unique number. Uh, hello is one, world is two, uh, devox is three, for example. But the data scientist explains that might work, but ideally those numbers have a meaning. And I know a technique called word embeddings. And now, is, again, you start learning. What are word embeddings? Yeah, actually it's a, a vector a representation of a word. And the closer uh, two words are to each other, the closer those vectors are. For example, king and man are close to each other. Queen and women are close to each other. But women and men are maybe farther apart. And so he started explaining, ah, and there is something called an embedding layer. And you can maybe propose to uh, do it together uh, in some pair programming way, or you start looking up what embeddings are, and you see that, are, that there are already a lot of libraries and, and layers available and models. Right. Then you continue your talk. Uh, um, Things like, uh, yeah, you need to deploy your model, it needs to be integrated in the application. Uh, we need yeah, the ac to know the accuracy of our model. You discuss the training test split. Eh? You see how that works. Again, you start learning. And then maybe something else you learn during those talks is uh, ideally you train eh, in a classification uh, problem, which is the spam detector. Eh? You have two classes, spam or regular email. Ideally, in your training set, you have as much examples of spam as regular emails. And then you can start explaining that there are techniques like downsampling, etc. Right? Again, another opportunity to start learning and adding extra layers of complexity and details. So now I'm going to go over to the demo. Um, so this is Kubeflow. Kubeflow in itself uh, can become a very big platform. Uh, I just uh, uh, deployed the basic installation, but there are a lot of add-ons you can add to, to Kubeflow. For my demo, I'm going to concentrate on, uh, on three things. A little bit about user management, uh, isolation versus uh, collaboration. Then I'm going to talk on how, um, how to do experiments. In, it's in something called notebooks, and I uh, will finish with, yeah, we did a whiteboard session where we basically created like an end-to-end -end machine learning workflow. How can you upload such a pipeline and run it through Kubeflow? Right. So this is the central dashboard. I'm logged in as an admin, and if I look on Kubernetes itself, all right. <laughs> Um, you will see that every uh, that every user corresponds with. Uh, by the way, the K you see here is an abbreviation for kubectl. Uh, um, that every user uh, corresponds to a profile, and at those profiles, if you describe, for example, the profile Bert, you will see that you can put things in uh, things like. Uh, resource limitations in it. 
for example, I can only use one GPU. Another important part is that every user has its own namespace, Kubernetes namespace, which means that you out of the box get your isolation using whatever Kubernetes tools you tend to learn, uh, to, to use. So this is the isolation part. So there are already a lot of tools out of the box available. Now you can also start collaborating um, by giving certain users access to your namespace. And then you can start you know, using your notebooks and your resources, etc. Right. Now everything you will be running, uh, those experiments, those notebooks, etc out of the box runs in your own namespace, right? And you will see that through the rest of the demo. Um, next topic was experiments. Like I mentioned before, data scientists, they, um, they tend to work in something called notebooks, which is kind of an interactive environment where they can do their uh, data exploration, data visual, uh, visualization, etc., and then they start training their model. Right? And in the past, uh, those data scientists had a notebook on their own laptop, right? But that comes with a, with, with a couple of limitations. Uh, for example, uh, you need to have the data on that laptop, meaning that that set of emails, which might be confidential, you need to somehow transfer it to the laptop. Right? Another thing is that uh, training large neural networks might consume a lot of compute power, which isn't always available on your machine. So Kubeflow has a way that you can spin up notebook environments on your cluster in your namespace. So you can create a new notebook environment, uh, call it whatever you want, uh, one, two, three, four. You can specify resource uh, limitation. You can also attach existing volumes. Uh, uh, like I mentioned, maybe that data engineer uh, created a dump in on some kind of the mails on, uh, I don't know, Azure file system. You can mount that Azure file system in your notebook so that it's accessible to, to play with. And then you basically launch your notebook environment. And if, uh, if I look to all the pods running in that admin namespace, you will see that it, there is one being created, DevOps 1234, which in the end, hopefully will run, yeah. And then you can connect to it and just start playing around. Now you can, so this is an interactive environment. Hello world. You can start working. For uh, the spam classifier, I of course already created uh, a notebook environment. Uh, yeah, this is another um, training example. Uh, it's a typical toy problem uh, in machine learning, classifying images of, uh, of clothing, uh, where you just can start playing around. Now in here, I created uh, the, 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 the pipeline for training that spam classifier. And now I come to the third part. How do you... Uh, transform those whiteboard boxes into actual pipelines. And it's a little bit like, um, like creating build and deploy pipelines uh, on your CI CD tools, right? You either can use, in the case of Kubeflow pipelines, you either can use YAML or you can use the uh, Python SDK. But it in, in the end, it will create a YAML file. And in here, is it is it big enough or, yeah? Um, in here, I created my um, Kubeflow pipeline. Um, so one thing to notice is you can provide uh, input parameters to your pipeline. I'm using an LSTM model, but yeah, 
too much detail. Just know that. Remember those, um, uh, those experiments I talked about that you can play with things like model architecture and training parameters. When you want to do a lot of experiments, you need to provide those uh, things you want to play with as input parameters to your pipeline. So I just decided to um, have uh, an input parameter for the model architecture. Uh, the number uh, NLSTM is the amount of hidden layers. And then one of the uh, training parameters or, or hyperparameters, which is the dropout rate, just as an example. And then you basically decide all the steps you want to do and the, um, the order in which you need to execute it. Um, you can just run a pipeline uh, sequentially, but you can also run certain steps in parallel. You can introduce things like um, conditions. Uh, for example, at the end, uh, you can, after the training, you want to, to evaluate your model and only if the accuracy is higher than the, the model that's already running on production or higher than, I don't know, 80%, only then you do the, your deploy. Now, every such a step, and I will take the example of the first one, is actually nothing more than um, a Docker container that you're running. So you need to provide a Docker image and a tag and a command to how to run it. Now that gives, of course, a lot of possibilities. It means that if you'd like to do your cleanup of your mails in Java or Scala, yeah, you're able to do it. As long as there's some Docker image you push, pushed in some registry, you can add it to your pipeline, right? Uh, you can uh, implement it using your local tools, uh, IntelliJ or whatever, and then uh, play on your local machine, and once it's ready, you can add it to the pipeline. Right. So that, again, uh, makes the collaboration uh, easier. And in the end, so it will give you a, a, a YAML, which you then can push to Kubeflow, and it will you give you a Kubeflow pipeline. You have a graphical representation. You can see what the different versions are. Uh, yeah, you can simplify the graph. And then you can start running your pipelines. You can go for a one-off run where you just run it once, or you can uh, let's say that every every Monday you get a new data set and you always want to retrain your model on Monday and see whether uh, the accuracy increases. You can also schedule it, uh, for example, using a, a cron expression, etc. And then, like I said, when running your model, you can play with the input pr uh, parameters you provided. Once you start running, you can, if you want, follow along. Now what happens is, so this pipeline has started. If I look at the pods, there was already one uh, um, pod that was being created uh, that already ran. And so that's a very fast one. Uh, the second one, is now running the data checkout, right? So it creates a new pod for every step in your pipeline. And the way you those different steps interact is using a volume that you created, right? So you persist your intermediate results on a volume. Those pipelines also provide you with the possibility if a certain step fails for some reason and you rerun your uh, pipeline, that it skips the, the, the successful steps. Right. Um, yeah, the complete training will take a long time, so I, of course, already um, run that pipeline, uh, did a cell and deploy, and then integrated uh, that deploy in a bigger service 
which in my case, I just used uh, uh, the fast API uh, Python library, but you can integrate it in, uh, I don't know, a Java, a REST Spring application, whatever, right? Just to, to finish and to show that it is actually working, um, and so it's still, it's still running. Um, so fast API um, also provides you out of the box with uh, open API specs um, and using the swagger you can actually run I also set up already the, the, the tunnels and the port forwarding etc um, you can try it out so let's try it out uh, hey a bit don't forget to bring your lemon cake to the party. And as you see, it is classified as ham, so not spam, with a very low uh, spam probability, uh, e to the power of minus eight. Right. If we would do the same thing for um, claim, your money from oh, the, the Nigerian prince. You would see that it is classified as spam with a probability of 90%. Right? So this was uh, my demo of, uh, of Kubeflow. Now to conclude, uh, yeah, I hope that uh, you now have a better general understanding of the core concepts of machine learning, the model development lifecycle, and uh, what MLOps is. And that maybe through MLOps you find your way into the magical world of, of machine learning, because yeah, it is an interesting area. And that somehow we can get that 24% a little bit closer to the 76%. So yeah, my name is Bert Gasset. Thanks for listening to my talk and uh, come visit our booth downstairs. Thanks. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So the so the question was whether it's feasible to train uh, using Kubeflow uh, deep neural networks uh, uh, on GPUs, right? Um, yeah. You have uh, whatever you have available in your Kubernetes cluster, you can use to train your models on. So definitely. Uh, when specifying uh, certain steps in your pipeline. You can also um, specify extra specs like uh, 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 things called node affinity uh, that you want uh, to use the, the, the nodes which are tagged, for example, GPU uh, as GPU. And then it only runs, uh, runs those steps on, uh, on a GPU in this case. So yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, <laughs> for uh, the example of the of the uh, the MNIST notebook, where is it? This is actually coming from <laughs> from a public repository, and this is actually a very, I think it's a very good uh, way to try it out. It's a very easy uh, use case. Uh, the training code is provided for you, but if you want to run it, uh, you can simply go over every step executed. And if you're interested, you either yeah, look into what the code is doing. If you think, yeah, the training part for now might be a little bit too deep into the, the, the data science world, yeah, you just execute it. Um, 
So you definitely have a look at, at, at this example. And there are actually on the Kubeflow uh, public repositories, there are like 100 uh, examples available. Uh, prediction of, uh, of, of uh, uh, cap rights in New York. Uh, there are a lot of those toy, toy problems uh, available. Uh, yeah. No more questions? All right, thank you.